if you just stare out of the window for that two to three minutes, not only are you allowing your brain time then to think about more actively the stuff that was running in the background, but you're also much more self-aware. So one of the problems that, that we've got is the less we spend time, and we think it's doing nothing, it's actually allowing your brain to do lots of different things that we keep stopping it doing by distracting it with, with screens and games and chat and Facebook and those things, Instagram. We're just getting in the way of the brain building really deep, um, chunked capacity and knowledge and understanding around many things. So it's, it's a shame because we we make it you know so much more superficial in so many ways and we don't allow for, the, for that really sort of high level connecting and chunking up of of concepts and philosophies and understandings about ourselves and about other things this is the inner the buzz podcast helping smart businesses be even more innovative Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 102 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses committed to innovation, to service and to modern marketing become even more innovative. We've got a really fascinating interview today with my guest, Dr. Fiona Kerr, who is industry professor for neural systems and complexity at the University of Adelaide here in Australia. Fiona advises and presents on a range of topics regarding the neuroscience of around how leaders build better brains and build creative, flourishing organisations. She's worked with amazing clients right throughout the world, including, among others, Cirque du Soleil, and she also advises the Finnish government on their artificial intelligence programs. This is a fascinating discussion about leadership and what we can learn from neuroscience and from Fiona's research into neuroscience to become better leaders, improve our brains and those of the people around us. Yes, we can improve the brains of the people around us. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Fiona Kerr. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to have here as my guest on the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Adelaide in South Australia, Dr. Fiona Kerr, who's Industry Professor for Neural and Com- uh, Systems Complexity, very complex to say, um, <laughs> at the University of Adelaide. Now, she advises and presents on a range of topics regarding the neuroscience around how leaders build both better brains and also creative and flourishing organisations. So welcome to the podcast, Fiona. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. It's great to have you here. Now, you um, both do research and you also um, consult with a whole range of companies right across the world about what's involved in building quality artificial intelligence and human partnerships going forward, which is fascinating, and also helping to shape that as a human-centric future, which I'm really fascinated by, so hopefully we can explore that some more. Okay. And in a way that humans can take advantage of of the unique benefits of um, both direct human interaction and the new technologies that provide. But you also um, warn of some of the dangers involved in, in overdoing a new technology, and so I'm looking forward to talk about that as well. Right. Oh, we've got a lot to cover. Yeah. All right. Now, before we talk about uh, leadership and neuroscience and new technology and that sort of thing, let's learn a little bit more about your background. So as a young child, did you have visions of going into this field? (laughs) Not at all. Um, Nope. I grew up as an Air Force brat, so 14 schools and a lot of travel. um, (laughs) Okay. Yep. So uh, I just, you know, I had completely different ideas. And I think uh, if you were to ask me at 49 if I was in, would be in this area, I would also have said no. So it's never too late to change, is it? Yeah, that's right. So how did you, how did you get into this field then? Uh, Well, the the two, the the one minute, I hope, hope, um, Mm. path is... I st- at 16, I started in genetics. I needed to pick up a half-subject 
and I chose witchcraft, which sounded really fascinating. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and that was so fascinating that it lured me out of science and into anthropology. So I did an anthropology degree and trotted off to Fiji and did some interesting stuff. My dad, who was an engineer in the Air Force, kept saying, get a real job. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so I ended up in power stations and coal mines and car manufacture and that kind of thing as an industrial relations mediator and then a manager and then a strategist and, and into organizations for almost 30 years. Um, working with people, often new technology was actually coming in if I look back. Um, I trained as, a psych, as an organizational psychologist, um, but I did do a majors in uh, neurophysiology and uh, or neuropsychology. So I was really interested and also I guess leading people too what got me really interested by um, by 50 I'd had a, my own business for a good 15 20 years working with companies to make them adaptive and that worked really well when you had a kind of a complex thinking leader who understood the difference between things like steerage and control and those things we hear about you know comfortable with things that weren't black and white and and the capacity to to build something which could be quite dynamic and flexible and yet understood when things need to be tight and when things need to be loose so there were these real consistencies and I thought what is it what is it that makes some systems whether it's a political body or a company adaptive so at 50 I thought well I can either go and work for another three years with another one because that's hmm. about how long it takes um, or I can delve into what's going on. And I was doing guest lecturing at, at universities anyway. Um, so I started by looking at it as complex systems. And so that's engineering. So I went back and did an engineering honours in, in systems complexity. And that taught me an awful lot about how systems work. And really anthropology is about human systems. So that added beautifully. But what it didn't tell me was, all right, so that's how systems work if you set them up to be adaptive. But why do people understand that in the first place? Do the people who set those organizations or, or systems up and lead them well, do they think differently? Do they have different brains? And it turns out, yes, they do. And, and do they change the brains of people in those systems so that everybody is more capable of, of understanding complexity? Yes, they do. So that got me really interested in neural systems, if you like. So I combined neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and systems engineering into the PhD, and it, it worked really well mm. yeah that's a fascinating journey <laughs> is starting off with witchcraft and, and into <laughs> which is probably a very complex complex system as well um yeah, it's, into, yeah. It's, yeah. it's all about you know trust and <laughs> and yeah we i'm sure we still use it in lots of ways yeah yeah but going from there into um the connected systems of the brain and cognitive um behavior and and also the um, technology system so it's fascinating yeah yeah mm. and what I didn't think about was the I guess the sweet spot in between um, was artificial intelligence um, mm. so, sorry so you can look at both you know neural systems and um, and artificial neural networks as well and what really interested me I guess because I was looking at it um, with all of those lenses, I suppose, um, anthropology, psychology, neuroscience, and, and um, sort of technical engineering was what happens when humans, with all of those things that, in, that we are, um, interact with technologies and what works, what doesn't, does it change the way humans interact with humans? And in fact, that was a really big part. The big part of what I do is look at the amazing um, impacts of human interconnection because we totally underestimate them and I used to be able to talk about them and and talk about the the power of trust and the importance of you know all sorts of things around building resilient relationships and the capability for good complex problem solving and and senior people at, at boards would smile and and you could see underneath they were thinking yeah but I know how to manage people <laughs> but interestingly if you go back and actually say this is what happens in the brain with a complex problem. This is what happens in the brain with, um, you know, assumed fairness, for, for example, or perceived fairness. And this is how it switches the capability of your brain to filter this information. And this is therefore how it changes the capacity for a strategic outcome. And if you give the science, then the same people sit there and go, oh, okay, well, this is real. <laughs> we need to really think about this. 
own. Yeah, yeah I, I saw a um, YouTube video where you, I think it was one of the TEDx talks that you gave on leaders changing brains and winning hearts, and it's very yeah. compelling <laughs> to um, hear the, you know, the what happens in the brain as as people respond to a leader who's behaving in different ways. Yes, it's it's fascinating. Um, one of the things I, I look at, and I, I think I just wrote for a paper, Wi-Fi of the Brain, um, and it's about how, especially charismatic and great leaders, um, you know, how do they say the right things at the right times? How do they have such good quality communication? And how are they able to light that fire and, and create that trust in people that they lead? And we, we physically neurally and physiologically and phys- at, at all sorts of ways we actually synchronize with each other as human beings and we don't think about that enough because it's extremely powerful in the chemical cascade it creates in brains and bodies and it's one of the reasons why you can have that real flourishment in some organizations and some relationships and some teams and others don't have it at all because they still have um, networks of chemicals occurring, but they're not going in the right direction. Sometimes mm. they're going in the wrong direction. So we, when once we're mindful of the fact that you know we we physically and physiologically impact each other, and it can be negative or positive, it's it's quite a different way of looking at the power of human interaction and how wonderful it can be and how complex it is. Whether it's a leader or it's a a nurse, so. Oh, sorry about that. One of the things I look at is, uh, or have been looking at, is the neurophysiological impact of, um, of touch and eye gaze on things like healing. Um, and that is incredible. Uh, again, it's a similar thing around when do you use the human nurse? Five minutes with a human nurse if someone's stressed means that that person will heal more quickly and leave the hospital uh, more you know, earlier and, and the nurse will be really fulfilled and because they get the same chemicals and mm. will stay and the organization as um as a company the health of the hospital will have people that leave and get well people that, that stay as staff and and feel fulfilled and they don't pay as much in <laughs> you know the tablets the pharmaceuticals the all the other ways that we're told yeah, are yeah. very efficient to handle that kind of thing so there's there's a myriad of ways to look at it Mm, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because um, if you think about it, the tablets and pharmaceuticals are chemicals that you ingest and, and um, from external sources, whereas if you use your approach, then what you're doing is triggering perhaps the same, same neural pathways or similar ones, but in a much more natural way. Yeah, you can get, um, if, if we look at touch, um, one of the fascinating things about how it sets off your immune system um, is that we can get higher levels of dopamine than we get in you know, therapeutic tablet form. Um, and even if we just go to that in a situation in a normal workplace, we, we set up something called dynamic resonance. So the fact that we share space, especially if we're doing something like um, a, a sort of a creative you know, team meeting or something, it has some... Some groups just really fire very well, um, and it's because they're they're physically um, getting into that whole dynamic resonance, which is putting up levels of various chemicals which change the way that their brain then is able to block out things like external distractions, and it, they engage multiple regions of their brain at the same time. They can be much more flexible. It speeds their brain up. It deactivates areas that might stop them thinking in these kind of you know cross-connected, really strange ways. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting in, mm. in all the kinds of areas. So, how do you suggest going about setting up that sort of dynamic resonance? Let's say in a meeting of of a bunch of people, or or if it's a leader um, trying to get his team into that sort of um, situation. I think partly it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so I'm thinking of a few different kinds of situations I guess I've been in over the years. So certainly as a mediator, um, going in to really tough environments where 
that, you know, the guys in the mine of, of they're on strike or something or the black band of supervisor or manager and they're ready to walk. Um, it's, it's very similar in some ways than being in a, a situation where there's a, a really complex problem that you have to commit to and, and work with others around. It's still a case of being, being there and directly interacting, you know, face-to-face -face with someone and getting them to really understand that you have an alignment in what you're trying to get out of this. And if you don't, they know it. Everyone knows it in the room. So if, you, if you're honest and if you really do all want to get this thing to work, then showing that you believe other people want to do that too and that you have the expectation that they will work at it and you trust that also creates that kind of, I guess, mix, if you like, in other people because you can't demand um, things like trust and collaboration if you don't show it. <laughs> so, again, we're very reciprocal in lots hmm. of ways. And leaders that are very good at that, um, that show sort of strong commitment and the ability to directly work with others when you need them to, um, they have very good quality, open communication. Um, and another thing they're very good at is, is that level of obvious collaboration. And one of the things that you're doing as a leader when you're saying, well, we have, we have a problem, and, that, and yes, I carry the can, but as a pragmatic optimist, I'm really glad that I've actually got you as a group to do this, means that you, you make really clear boundaries around the expectations for people, but you also share that risk and you share the positives of the outcome as well. So it's an interesting, yeah, it's, it's an interesting um, kind of um, conundrum where what you want to do as a leader is to make sure people know that you're not going to leave them in the lurch. So you're going to be the, the person who's responsible. But at the same time, you, you know perfectly well that the people that you're dealing with are the ones that are going to make this work best and that together you're going to get the better outcome. And if you really believe that, then other people pick it up because you synchronize, you actually physically <laughs> synchronize when you are interacting with people like that. You know, we pick up those things really strongly mm. when we interact. That's, that's a fascinating, uh, fascinating approach. And I think... You know, it, it makes sense in a lot of ways, but it's not perhaps that widespread, is it? Yeah, I think some. I think we all know the leaders that do it well mm. um, because they are those people with... Well, in the thesis, the thing that I could have talked about an awful lot of different things that good leaders do, but the fascinating thing to me was of the examples that I used over kind of 15 years, the people that were really good, adaptive, complex thinking leaders that built very resilient, positive, flourishing types of environments. They, they had a few things that all of them did. So the first thing was they all had a very clear idea about what they were there to do. And it's different potentially than the, the mission that you put on the wall. Yeah, they really did live the, the reason they were there. And that was very clearly, easily shareable with anyone in the organization. So it was aligned, sort of what the organisation did and people in it were clearly aligned to, to this outcome. The second thing that was very tight was a clear set of values. And it's not that easy, actually, being a, a high values organisation because you have to be consistent. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that can be pretty tough. And so what that means is you've got people who know where they're going and they know that people are going to you know, have their backs when they step into that kind of unknown because things are always changing. They are dynamic. We know that. And it means that you, what you've got is bounded optimism, if you like, and, and bounded permission. So people, because people feel safe, because leadership isn't about saying, that, don't worry, don't worry, things won't change. Mm. It's about saying things are going to change, but that's okay. Um, and, and you'll be supported through that, but you need to, you need to, Step into that. You need to actually test yourself as well. And, and people will do that if they trust that 
that values base is there. Um, and partly to do that, that's where the pragmatic optimism comes in. That was the third thing I saw with every one of them. They were able to, in a room, say, this is not going to be the easiest thing in the world, but with you guys, we really do have the best you know, possible shot at this. And we're going to figure out how we do it as we go and, and know that there will be non-negotiables that make it really clear. And then there'll be, within that, um, room to play and be very innovative and creative. Mm. Yeah, that's. Um, I like those three points, and I like the combination too. Um, how how do you propose that you know in a remote working situation? So there's lots lots of organisations these days that have remote working setups where people, um, like we are right now, are basically yes. using technology to communicate and and do that pretty much as a rule rather than face to face. Yes, um, and it's and it's an interesting uh, problem because of the way that our brain works, if you like, um, over technology. If we go back to the fact that um, it's about understanding connectivity, if you like, um, because we physically synchronise with people when we are together with them, what that means is that what we need to do is make sure that we get together with people pretty early on if they are going to work remotely. So one mm. of the things I made sure that I did was if I had staff that weren't with me, I met them. Um, if they were really remote, then I, I met them within the first week. If they were in my building, I met them within the first 48 hours. And we sat opposite each other and were able to talk about, you know, what do you do, what do I do, what do you think you're here for? Just that kind of, if you like, that, that first meeting of the minds, um, which I now know creates all sorts of physiological connection and, and spindle neurons and mirror neurons and all those things. Um, and what's interesting is if you do that very early on, whether it's a, a remote maybe team that's around the world um, or a single person who's come in remotely to an organisation, then you've got to get them together very, very early because the, the neurological changes that occur with direct interaction mean that... From then on, technology can be used much more effectively. So then you can use the screens um, as long as you regularly get together. And partly that, how often depends on what you're doing. You know? So if there's, say, a change in a situation, if there's a real difficulty that you have to deal with, um, if there's a highly creative part to what you're doing, in those times we greatly benefit from being in the same space because of the neurophysiology of interaction. Um, mm. And then again, you can use the technology. So I love technology. I mean, I, I use it all the time. Mm. It enables me to do my work. I've been very lucky to be part of actually designing technology that's really cool, that helps people. Um, so I guess what I'm about is um, we are technologized and we will keep on being so, and it offers huge transformative benefits but we need to understand when do we use it, when do we have to have direct human interaction, and when does it not matter? So I guess the really easy way to say it is, is when is a human efficient and effectively better, when is the technology um, superior, and, and when is it totally neutral? And then you make really good decisions around how you utilise both technology and human interaction in the workplace, at home, and anywhere, really. Hmm. That's that's great. Um, I understand a little bit more now because I, I've been talking to a lot of people recently, businesses that are looking to um, bring remote teams on board or, you know, remote workers. And I've always said to them, you know, the best way to hire people is actually go there and do yeah. it in person. Um, but that's based on experience where, you know, I know that in person I've been a lot more successful than where it wasn't in person. Yes. Um, but now I have a scientific explanation, so it's <laughs> great. Yeah. Well, you're right. And, and the two really easy ways to think about it, one is that, um, again, uh, we synchronise. And if you're a, especially if you're a kind of a, a charismatic type of proactive uh, leader or, or manager, your social networks in your brain are very efficient. They're very quick at lighting up the other person's brain too and getting that kind of quite direct connection. So you can read, you know, thousands of times more 
mm. uh, informate types of information than you can read over a screen. And the other thing is we really are still much less capable of streaming the kinds of information data that we need to pick up around uh, people's capacity for interacting, for, um, I guess, bonding, all of those sorts of things. Because probably in my pre-academic time, I've probably fired 50 people over my life, and not one of them was about a technical capacity or a skill deficit. It was all about people, people interaction, the capacity to collaborate or to manage or to, you know, to, to be empathic. Um, those sorts of things are always why people move around and they're hardly ever what we have on the, the job sheet. Mm, that's right, yeah. And they also say that people join good companies and leave bad managers. So. Yes, and, and if we get, sometimes I get into the discussion around how can you get people who are really linear managers or leaders that don't understand they are, you know, very non-empathic ones, how can you get them to understand that they need to be more people oriented and in short it's very difficult because you're shifting the I guess the filters that they use to to look at the world but one of the interesting things around the point you've just made is the the way that people recognize the fact that they're not connecting and not taking into consideration awful lot of that capacity of people around that you know that the feelings and the social aspect and the emotional uh, capacities um, is for them to be faced with how they are impacting people um, from the people that they they work with, and and you're only going to get that happening in a very high trust environment. So, if you are in a very positive culture, which reinforces you to be able to say to someone, "You make me feel like this when you do that," and and it's a real shame, then that's going to potentially improve and get better. But leaders who are those kind of, you know, the hierarchical sort of cold, hard ones, they don't go into those organisations because they go into the ones that maintain um, that sort of element to be able to stay at arm's length, not get told the truth and, and have very low trust. So you get this cyclic reinforcement in organisations. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame. You get that catch-22 of those people will stay in those organisations, which just reinforces the, st the style of that organisation. Mm. But I guess and if that's what you like, then it's where you're comfortable. <laughs> yeah, although I was just going to say that um, in terms of long-term success, I would think that organisation is probably going to be at a severe disadvantage compared to another organisation that has that um, safe kind of environment where everybody can have their say and everybody can make a contribution um, commensurate with their own abilities and you know actually make a difference to the organization yes and and what you said was commensurate to their abilities which is a very good point so i've seen people try to do the opposite as well i've been involved with an organization who decided they wanted to be completely you know uh flat and, and completely, yes, everyone can be part of all of the discussions and, and decisions. And as you might imagine, I think it took three months for them to decide to, <laughs> to put structure back in mm. and to start having um, sort of tight fix, you know, the non-negotiables, because it, that actually adds information into the system. Um, one of the fascinating things about getting organisational structure right is... That, when I look at complex systems, some people say, oh, okay, so does that mean you can just have an organisation working like a, a completely self-managing complex system, which it does anyway, but you still need to have uh, that system sort of, it's called bounded, but you need to, to have it structured by what are we here to do, what are the questions we're here to ask, and so you need a basic structure to steer against, and you need rules that allow people to know when they're involved and when they're not because if everyone's involved in everything it just gets really confusing mm. so so that becomes quite quite interesting of what level of rule creates enough structure that you don't lose everything every time you find something that works you know how do you put in place something that you've seen work and actually capture that and make it part of how the company works and yet not put in place the things that didn't work, that people were kind of working around. And how do you even identify the difference? Um, 
and often companies don't and just asking that question almost like a, a cultural audit once a year is really useful um, yeah. mm, that's um, that's really great advice I mean one of the things that I hear often is people and and often it's a business owner complaining that their people don't show enough initiative and so on and I wonder if that's because you know, there isn't that safe environment and there isn't those boundaries. You know, it's kind of like an expectation that show some more initiative, which is, I think you talk about this in one of your presentations. It's, you know, be creative or something was the example you used, which oh, yeah. is really hard to do if, you, if that's what you, you're asked. <laughs> Whereas if if it's more structured than that, then perhaps there's, uh, there's a bit of direction there and also the brings that safety into it. Yeah, and that's that's a really good example of talking about what are the boundaries because people need a clear mandate um, to to work to, if you like. Um, and one of the things that does is if you're going to agree on, you know, what's not negotiable, what are we here to actually do, and um, and that that actually reframes risk. You know, what is my permission to act? Where is my personal responsibility? What am I actually empowered to do? Um, and people talk about those terms all the time, you know, permission to act um, or delegation. It's really interesting that that the good manager will understand that that is about have people got the facts they need, have they got the resources they need, and have you actually given them permission to do the things they need to do without having to check in all the time? Um, because what you get then is you get this lovely situation where you engage the complex thinkers uh, they've got enough room to come up with new solutions. Um, whereas if, if they haven't got one of those three, they're constantly going to be knocking up against something or running around trying to get, you know, trying to get that permission. Um, and, and it's the same with empowerment, that lovely term that I oh, just used to hear every day, all day for many, many years when it was you know, really cool, probably 10 years ago. But in order to be empowered, it's not just, well, there you go, off you go, you can do it now. Is it something meaningful? So this, I get these five things I remember reading somewhere, and it was a very good summary. It basically talked about um, like what it, it, easy words. If it's a meaningful thing, if people have choice around what how they go about it, if they Hello? something that's useful to it, if they can see progress um, and if it aligns with their values, then then people feel truly empowered. And it was really interesting working with unions and new groups and defence and some of the interesting groups I ended up managing, um, looking at those sorts of things and, and looking at that real clarity around when do you get involved and, and, and when do you not and what does the value stuff look like. So I ended up at one time... Um, as an operations manager for a small defence company. So I had like 80 ex-SAS guys and mechanics and they called me, but when they got to know me well, um, they ended up telling me later that they they called me a cross between the Oriste and the Velvet Hammer. <laughs> um, and they said, because on a daily basis you could be so nice and so positive, but if we went over the line with one of those not negotiable things, like a very clear value then that was it, you were the velvet hammer, and we knew that it was coming down. <laughs> so those were the, the things that, you know, were not not negotiable. Mm. Because then, then no one else feels safe if you, if you let them slip. Yeah, that's right. Now, you did drop out there for a bit, so could you repeat those five points just oh, okay. briefly? Yeah. All right. Um, so I got meaningful and alignment, but I missed some okay. of the others. So if it's meaningful, um, if... If the person feels they have choice around how they go about this, and that's the second. So the third thing is, is related to that. Can they bring their competence to bear um, in the, the thing that they're doing? Mm -hmm. The fourth is, are they seeing progress? Are they actually seeing things move forward? Because if you don't feel that, then you just feel like you're stagnating. And the fifth is, does it align with their values? Which is why I went off into talking about values. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's really interesting because if you give the other four to people but it doesn't align with their values people will still feel compromised yeah yeah well the values alignment one is a big one isn't it and and often people don't even realize um that there's a misalignment there but they just it's something feels wrong it's yes, yes. there's a gut feeling type thing yep 
yep, that's and it's really strong. Mm. Eventually, it takes a while to creep up. Sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, um, that's fascinating. Now, when I heard you speak in Geelong, you talked about taking care of our brains and um, you know the, I think there were five things you mentioned so I was wondering whether you could share that with our audience. Ah, okay so, so one of the things people are always fascinated in, I got really interested in do in why can people in organisations who are allowing them all the things we've just talked about, how is it that they get better at complex problem solving you know, are they actually growing new brain in this kind of mm. wonderful way that they can use it more? And in an easy way to think about it, yes, they are. So there's something called neurogenesis, which is actually growing new brain. And you can grow new brain all your lives, um, which we didn't realize before. And a big part of it is paying attention. You have to pay attention to things in order to, to stimulate, if you like, a new brain. But there's five ways that individuals um, can do it. Uh, so the first is around um, exercise because that uh, allows our brains to, to, yes, get glucose and oxygen, those kind of things, but we were, kind of, we were built to, to make decisions on the move. You know, human beings are not built to sit still. Mm. So one of the things is um, we get a neurochemical called BDNF when we exercise, and it allows us to start uh, building new networks, and especially um, to look at the hippocampal area and middle middle area which is learning and memory the second thing that's pretty similar to that is is novelty so learn new things and the easy way to think about that is if you're learning something brand new then you almost need to build new real estate in order for mm. you know for you to be able to lay it down the third thing is actually the microbiome so <laughs> in, in our, our gut is the second brain we're hearing a lot about that now and what we need to think about is the gut often is the, or is the thing for a lot of our neurotransmitters um, to be built in. So I think we're in the sixth week of, um, of development inside the womb. The neural crest divided into two, into the central nervous system and the, the brain at the top and the enteric nervous system and our gut. So it's, it's not though a joke it's a million and a half neurons and it really is what you eat uh, directly affects how you think and how good you feel and whether you're depressed and all those sorts of things um and a fourth thing is it's actually human interaction it's really critical and it's it's uh, one of those things that, for the reasons we've just talked about, creates all of these lovely chemicals and all of this synergy and all of these capabilities and allows us to think differently. Um, if we engage directly empathically, we go into different ways of thinking. Called One of them is called discernment, where your motor neuron system pushes you into using a different filter to pick up information to make decisions. So you're actually using completely different criteria, which is long-term and consequential. So you are different in what you think about as relevant, how you make decisions, and what your lens is, I guess, around decision-making. And the fifth thing is sleep. So we have different patterns during the six or seven hours sleep. And the first few are around maintenance. So you clean your brain, glial cells get sticky plaque off, all of those sorts of things. You lower your heart rate. So you're, you're maintaining body and brain. And then you start getting, and you get a little bit of REM, rapid eye movement, but you get more and more of that until in about the, the sixth to seventh, you get something called pre-REM2, which is when the brain says, right, now I've cleaned, I'm going to take all of the information we've stored in the kind of, you know, midterm memory and file it away. And that's when you, you embed a lot of the learning. So if you only get a few hours sleep, you don't even do that very well. Hmm. And then eventually um, you go into full REM and that's the frontal lobe shuts down. You don't have that kind of logic police saying you can't fly and there's rules. They all disappear, which is why you can do all those strange things in a dream. <laughs> and, and that's when the brain sort of says, well, now everything's neat and tidy. I'm going to now crisscross it and I'm going to make new connections and I'm going to put things together that weren't there before and that's a really highly creative state and I don't know if you've got up in the morning especially if you don't have an alarm and you just let yourself lie there and think and because you're coming out of REM 
your your capacity for abstractive thought, your capacity for that. Oh, that's what I need to do now. Oh, that's where that. Oh, that's what I should say to that person. Oh, that's a, another idea for I don't know how to get the water around the house. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Those things come to you in those times. It's one of those sort of daydreaming mode times, and it's because your brain is really speedily connecting those kind of things in new ways and. And the problem is, one of the problems is, if you then are in the middle of that and off goes your alarm on your phone, you pick the phone up and you start to scroll, hmm. you kill that. You just stop it. You stop distraction. It, sorry, you, st- you stop that um, abstraction immediately. So I try not to do that. I, I really do. That's my working time. <laughs> hmm. it's, where it's part of when my brain's making these lovely new connections when I have new ideas. Okay, so what do you, what do, you do with that? Do you journal or something like that one it's quite interesting some people um quite a lot of people because you then have to open your eyes pick up a pen use your motor neuron system again you're engaging different parts of your brain Hmm. and and sometimes you lose the thoughts you had so i've got a um, a little thing that i can just pick up and and press the button and i tape it so i can still be lying there with my eyes closed okay and i dictate Hmm. yeah Hmm. that's fascinating yeah um (laughs) I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about the power of daydream because one of the things that happens to me, that, that sort of state that you described there, I often find that. Now, my routine in the morning is usually I get up and I kind of get straight, I jump up, the alarm goes off, I jump up and get straight out and get my bike gear on and hop out on the bike. Now, often um, what I find is, particularly if I'm alone on the bike, um, that those that sort of situation comes up that all of a sudden I have an idea or or I think about oh this is how I can deal with that issue or here's how I can deal with that situation and it's um it's kind of almost like a daydream situation because I'm I'm focused on something totally different um but unconsciously obviously something else is happening yes yes So are you saying how do you maintain that or how do you use that or what's the question? Sorry. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I guess I I was wondering whether that was a similar sort of state as coming out of, um, you know, coming out of a deep sleep without the alarm going off and without sort of getting on to technology and... and Yes. Yes is the the easy word. So you're kind of Hmm. number one. That's the exercise thing. Hmm. When you exercise, because of the way that we also use our motor neuron system, it's a really interesting turn on of various bits of our brains. Um, and you're, you're highly oxygenating, you're moving, there's um, also stimulation of, of what you're moving through. Um, we're very good on our feet. Um, if we, if we, I, I do, uh, for interest, some looking at things like um, dance, you know, creativity. Mm-hmm. So I do some work with Cirque du Soleil. And it's around creativity and creative ideation and how the brain chunks up the knowledge around a new movement or utilizes music and to phrase it over your, it fractionates it around your brain and how the movement is connected to what, when you're learning something new and what that means for how you practice it and where you practice it. And it's fascinating. People, again, our brains are so, so, capable they're so magnificently complex that they're taking in so much information and they're doing so much in the background um that if you allow that then you can get this really rich picture that you can dive into one of the problems we've got is that we we're i guess what you call the distraction economy now Mm. so we've got that you know i think i did a talk one of the other talks uh the tedx's was look into my eyes and it was it was the frustration I feel. Of. <laughs> yeah. I think I said, you know, if, if you're in a coffee line, you've got that three minutes. How many people chat to someone next to them that they don't know? How many people daydream, um, which is exactly what you're talking about, go into mm. that lovely abstraction mode, and how many people just go for their phone? Because they're all an act of choice, and they make a huge difference not only to your own brain, but also to the, the brains and the moods of the people around you. So I don't know if you've felt next time, Chat to someone if you don't normally mm. do it and just see how good you feel and them. And what often happens is you get this little mini contagion effect of everyone starts to talk. Mm. Um, but if you you can stop it immediately almost by, you know, just putting your head down and looking at your phone and everyone like sort of head drops. Yeah. And so we have this incredible capacity to either increase that whole 
sort of chemical sort of contagion positive effect um, or, or dampen it down. And too often that's what we're doing when everyone stares at their phones for those three minutes. Oh, this, this won't matter. I'll just do a game or I'll do something. Mm. The abstraction thing you talked about on the, on the um, being on the bike, if you just stare out of the window for that two to three minutes, not only are you allowing your brain time then to think about more actively the stuff that was running in the background, but you're also much more self-aware. So one of the problems that, that we've got is the less we spend time, and we think it's doing nothing, it's actually allowing your brain to do lots of different things that we keep stopping it doing by distracting it with, with screens and games and chat and Facebook and those things, Instagram. We're just getting in the way of the brain building really deep, um, chunked capacity and knowledge and understanding around many things. So it's, it's a shame because we, we make it you know, so much more superficial in so many ways and we don't allow for, the, for that really sort of high-level connecting and chunking up of, of concepts and philosophies and understandings about ourselves and about other things. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's really great advice. And a lot of that is around a bit of self-reflection and, and allowing the time to not be distracted, I yes. guess. Yes, yes, yeah. that's true. I'm it's funny. That. Go on. Sorry. Yeah, it's um, funny because um, like the classic picture going into a, an elevator and there's a bunch of people in the elevator and everybody kind of looks at the ceiling or looks at the uh, display panel or looks at the wall and there's not a lot of conversation going on. And, I mean, I, I'm normally an introvert, so I, I'm probably one of the worst offenders for this, but, but I have gotten into an elevator when I'm in the mood and I'll actually break the silence and say something. And, and it's amazing that that kind of does generate straight away that kind of level of interaction and all of a sudden people spark up and um, if it's you know something topical there'll be a conversation and people will actually stand in the doorway rather than get straight off and leave they'll stand in the doorway to continue the conversation yes we're very good at that hmm. and one of one of the reasons is right from the basis our brains react differently even the first time we we look at someone else's eyes so if you're walking down the mall I don't know if you've ever um, felt it, but and you, you suddenly feel like you actually catch you know, hundreds of people go past, and then suddenly you catch someone's eye, hmm. and, and we even call it that. And and you kind of go, oh, because it it brings them into sharp relief. You're actually connected, and and that's because you actually have what the brain says when you directly focus on someone else's retina in that way, even if it's at a distance, is it basically says okay, incoming potential social activity. And the, the thing it makes us tend to do is to, to go towards that person. So it's one of the reasons that we smile when that happens. And if you smile, the other person will tend to smile automatically. And even if you then look away and keep going, you've still made that connection. And a part of your brain has, has lit up that doesn't light up at any other time. But even if you just look 10 to 20 degrees, five, you know, just look off to the, the edge and don't quite meet their eye. And another part of the brain lights up and it says, nope, that person is not interested in connecting with me. And the motivation is to actually avoid. Hmm. So we are physiologically and very quickly um, built to respond to that sort of connection. So that's just walking down a street and catching someone's eye. When you're actually standing in something like a lift, we then have all this lovely dynamic resonance going on. And I can't tell you how many times in, you know, sort of, sort of cricket waiting lines or any of those sorts of things where you end up with this terrific conversation for ages. Um, yeah, it's because people do like connecting. We are built to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. I could go on and talk for ages here, but I'm <laughs> aware of the time. So um, I thought um, it's probably a good time to go on to our buzz. So this is kind of a bit of a switch here because it's more about some um, recommendations around business, but I'm pretty sure that mm -hmm. it'll have direct, <coughs> like, like your experience, will have direct impact on this and it'll be all well connected. So the innovation round is designed to help our audience who are primarily see themselves as innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got 
five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire <laughs> people to do something awesome. Something like pressure. <laughs> All right. What's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Okay. Um, I think observe and uh, listen, watch and daydream. Um, so for me, it's, it's how do we do it? better like what is being done in the first place and how do we do it better and so when I've worked with people who are innovative they they're very good at just watching and observing and thinking really thinking about something and what's happening there and then they try it mm, that's great advice yeah so paying attention to things like you said earlier yeah all right what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas Okay, I can think of, I can think of two things. Uh, one of the things that's worked, and it has, it has been a bit scary sometimes for either organisations or, or the people involved, is I've actually taken away milestones and measures. <laughs> um, so not the what are we here to to actually, what's the question we need to to solve to answer, or what's the problem we need to solve, but how do we measure how we're doing it? Um, quite often I've actually taken them away if I've joined an organisation to do something. And one of the reasons is because whenever you, you, you measure or test, you always drive down to that lowest level and you only capture quantifiable things. So when I've taken away the timeframes or measures very often and just really obviously expected people to, to go for it you know, because they do have that capacity and I've given mm. them that permission – we always get bigger and better and faster. And the other thing I've often asked them is, well, if this was your business, how would you do it? Because everyone in that room then, <clears throat> is me answering that question, sees the problem and sees the capacity in the organisation from a different angle. And if you add them all up, and none of us can see it from the other person's angle either. So then if you add all of that up, you've got a really good basis mapped for, for making decisions around you know, where you go next. Mm, yeah, that's a fascinating approach. So, so essentially, with the milestones and measure, you you're giving people permission to exceed those and and not fo not necessarily focus on them, but focus on achieving an outcome. And to actually design them. So, even in mm. General Motors, it ended up being a case of, well, what would you guys on the shop floor? You know, we had a problem with um, <coughs> excuse me, with things uh, be had getting reworked, and there was loads and loads of reportage on rework. So I said to them, okay, what would you measure? Again, if this was your plant, this was your livelihood, what do you reckon? What, what will tell you whether you're getting this right or wrong? And they came back and they made three charts. There was no numbers, there was charts. And they put them around the crib room and it was great because they were the things that really meant something to them. And the guys had come in straight off the shop floor, look at it and shake their head and go, God damn, and they'd wander out again. And... I think the rework went down by like two thirds within months, mm -hmm. and because what what you're doing is you're making the information they're getting on on how we move forward meaningful to them. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. All right. Um, so, do you have a favourite process or a tool or system to improve your productivity, allow you to be more innovative? I give myself permission to to well to daydream to sit and think so very often i i map i always have um a big piece of paper or or a wall so my um my study at home is actually painted the whole wall is painted as a whiteboard and i draw so i spend a lot of time just just drawing what I think are all of the different things and then where are the connections, what am I missing, what else is that connected to. So I, I, that's what I do. I map when I'm thinking and I come mm. up with some of the maps are as big as my whole wall. Um, but I get a really good idea then of what, what that sort of concept is and where the problems are and what's, what's connected to something else that I didn't think about before and where the openings are and the possibilities. So... Yeah, that, that's what I do, I map. Okay, I love it, yeah. Um, I do a lot of mind mapping too and I've got, I don't quite have the full wall here as a whiteboard, but I've got large chunks of it. I love to stand up there and just draw on. <laughs> yep. 
Mm. And also your brain looks at it differently. It looks as it is a picture. So I find I can maintain huge amounts of information. And it's because when I think about a point, um, I actually look at the space that it, it is mm. on my map. Mm. <laughs> so it's coming as a picture. Yeah. Yeah, it's great advice. All right, what's the best way to keep a project on track? Uh, listen, um, <laughs> ask questions and talk about it. Um, yeah, so very often for me, um, when they were quite complex uh, projects or even programs, so I once had 47 projects in a program mm -hmm. and, they, and about 30 of them were not in my jurisdiction. So we changed the role to an integration manager and I spent a lot of time asking questions and listening. Um, and I think that then that's a much better way to figure out, you know, where the, where the dips are and where the, where the humps are. The other thing I guess I would say there is I always gave people permission to come and tell me what they were seeing um, because one of the things is when you, when you get information about how something's either working well or not working, it's usually at the, at the front end of whatever you're doing. And those people rarely have permission to be able to put that information into the system. So I always tried to say, what is the, what is the way that are, ev are everyone who can ever see anything that would be useful able to tell someone about that? Are they able to get that information in there? And that was the other thing that was very useful because if I'm talking to a client or the pro I'm in the project and I'm wondering and asking questions, that the information that's coming in from the, you know, the, the outlier areas or from the direct interaction areas was priceless in figuring out what was actually happening compared to what we thought was happening. Mm. That's great. a great tip, yeah. Okay, and what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? I think very often what we don't do probably because of how we're built, is we, we don't really find out, is this the right question? Mm. So if you're there to differentiate yourself, to either um, carry out a service, to make something, to do something, to answer a problem, I always stand back and say, is this the problem that needs answering? Or is, is, it, is that even the base? Or is this already a solution? And we have to, can we step back from this? So that kind of five whys is always really useful to me. Mm. It's simple, but it works really well. So I think differentiating yourself by trying to say, yes, I have a, a bunch of capacity. That's why I'm here. And I trust in that. Um, but what I need to do is, is just actually find out what the problem really is and know that just like everybody else, I have... I have biases, I have knowledge and wisdom as well, and I have to check which one that is. Am I, am I assuming things or am I actually going on really good observation and understanding? Um, because everybody does both. So, you know, is it the right question? Is it the right problem? Mm, that's really good advice. And I love the five whys. I use it all the time. And, yeah. um, and I noticed somebody wrote a blog post recently that I saw where they, they were actually applying it to marketing, which is where I kind of use it the most but you're right you know we make we all make assumptions and um go down a path before really testing is it the right question is it the, is that the problem that people are really concerned about yes mm. all right um this has been great so um what's the future for you then and and for some of the things you're doing. I notice you're also involved in the Human E project, which, um, judging by the website there, is in very early stages. Very early. Um, hmm. So Jordan Nguyen and I have been try trying for a couple of years to get that up and running. So uh, probably very very close um, in, that, in that space. So um, one of the things I got involved in in Finland in June was... Um, I was talking there on partnering with artificial intelligence for a human-centric future, and I'm now on their steering committee, um, advising the steering committee for their kind of AI program for their country. Um, and what, what I'm looking at is that differentiation between um, how do we make sure that we understand the neurophysiological 
impacts of, of interaction with human to human and then with human to technology and then with the use of technology for human to human. So a lot of my work is, more and more of my work is going towards actually a research centre to do with um, understanding what technologization brings to us and also understanding the I guess the, the neurosociological aspects as well of that and you know how do you make sure that the technology we use makes us more productive and communicative and, and connected and capable instead of less because even in organizations I work with organizations around how technology sculpts you at work and how do you ensure that you get the best out of it and not not the worst out of it um, so yeah that's I guess one of the things that I'm I'm looking at what are the what is the human better when is technology better and and when is it neutral so how do we think really intelligently about this this future we're in already? Mm. Mm. Fascinating, fascinating subject and uh, fascinating to see where all that heads. So, um, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in innovation? Innovation. Working with innovative companies in, in different countries, one of the things that I noticed all of them were really good at, whether it was a Circ or a Ubisoft or whatever they are, was they were really good at thinking and asking um, about what people either want or need or, or like or they're missing. So they were very good at, again, um, asking sort of, the right questions so what is it that if you want to make something and well what is it that people actually need or want and um, what's not in whatever's being done so you either have to do something I think better or differently or you or you have a new problem that you found to solve and I think very much innovation is uh, is that stuff around it needs to be brand new as well most innovation is that lovely serendipitous kind of interplay between, you know, time and space and capacity. It's, it's doing something often that's already done, but doing it better, um, whether it's in a company or for a market. So I think that, that actually figuring out what is it that either you want to do to innovate or what is it that the other person wants or needs um, or misses or likes hmm. is, it's a really good basis. And so how are you going to do it either differently or better or, or is this completely new? Mm, thanks for that. That's, that's fascinating. I did, um, reminded me I was watching a, um, over the weekend a documentary about Lego and the story of how when they've been making the plastic toys since the 1940s. Yes. And in... I think in the early 2000s, they almost went bankrupt because essentially what they were doing was taking on all these high-tech things that, and, and making, rather than making them as kits, making them almost as complete uh, toys. And yes. so they were going away from their core expertise and away from what the market wanted. They weren't really paying attention. Um, and then when they realised they were close to being bankrupt and, and somebody must have helped them but they turned it around, essentially going back to their core. But what they realised was that um, beyond just, you know, the basic brick and, and putting together kits and so on was that they could leverage technology in a completely different way and that was bringing people together across the social media and, and then bringing them together in real life who are, you know, people who are doing innovative things with the Lego bricks. So there are people that were, um, you know, doing artwork with Lego or people that were building massive cities or people that were actually using it as um, to, to put together prototypes in architecture, for example, put together working models as... So they, you know, they weren't playing. They were doing serious business with it. So all of a sudden there was this whole community sprung up around it and they went back to their core business. But, um, you know, the innovation was around how they got their community to actually come together and, and be the best ambassador for it that, um, that they could ever have. If you think about it, Another way, but the same story though, what they're doing is they are going back, you're absolutely right, they're going back to their roots in that 
what Lego is, is it's an enabler for, for children and people to be creative. Mm. And if you give someone something where all you have to do is put on two bricks and it's finished, that's not what's happening at all. You've exactly. taken all of yeah. that away. Mm. So what they did with having all these people now coming in and showing how they can use it in different environments and spaces is really, you know, giving really good examples of, of creating things. Um, and that's one of the problems we've very often got in that we haven't talked about that whole kind of area of creativity and increasing creative capacity. And that starts in childhood. So I, I just really, <laughs> um, apart from the fact that we have screens and technology for kind of under twos, which mm. is a different subject again, um, so many of the toys even now are these plastic things that are already pre-done and all you have to do is press the button or turn the wheel. That's, mm. That is not what is going to create a physics engine in a baby, you know, a child's head or yeah. all those sorts of things. You need uh, the capacity for 3D manipulation and, and dynamic creativity and all that kind of stuff. So that's why they like the pot and the pan and the mud. Um, mm. Yeah, so yeah, it's a really interesting example. Um, of what what is it a Lego book actually does? <laughs> yeah, that's right, and that and you're right. It's the experience, I and mean, they kind of went away from that, and yeah. the experience was something completely different there with yeah. the the toys where you just put one thing on and it was ready to go. Yep. Mm. All right. Well, thanks very much, Fiona. This has been really fantastic. Where can people get in touch and say thank you? Oh, um, well, they can. They can email. Um, um, I don't know. Do I give it to you, or do you? <laughs> oh, we can point. Yeah, we can point them to your website or yeah. or an email I've, address I've if you like. Yep, yeah, I've got a website and mm. email address. Um, I've got a Twitter. I guess I could tell you all of those things and put it on the website. Is yep. that what normally happens? Yeah, that's right. We'll have links to all of those, um, yeah. and people can make comments and give you input. And thank you for all that you've shared with us today. Great. I look forward to some interesting conversations. <laughs> yeah. So I really appreciate your time and your insights that you've given us today on the Innova Buzz podcast. And I've really enjoyed this. I've learned some more based on um, our discussions, even more than what I learned from your presentation in Geelong. So I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Yes, we will indeed. Thank you very much for asking me. Oh, one thing I forgot to ask you was... Um, who do you want me to interview on a future podcast? Ah. Oh. oh. What sort of a person? Have you interviewed Mary Freer? No. She's interesting. She runs the Compassion Lab. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll, we'll have to add that uh, into the recording. Yeah. Mary Freer, the Compassion Lab. Oh, yeah, she's interesting. Have you interviewed Jill Hicks? No. Yep, she's interesting too. So she's mad for peace. She was a person who lost her legs in the London bombing. So we talked mm. together actually. We, we're, we're going to do a talk next year with the Dalai Lama. Um, oh, and, uh, yeah, so, mm. so she talks. Um, she says she's the, the physical outcome of the science I talk about. Um, yeah, that she kind of gone through such a horrific situation mm. and she's come out saying, you know, we need to have much more positive attitude towards radicalization there's a completely different way to handle this so she's come out empathically you know positive and what was fascinating to me was when we talked about it she was touched all the time when she was down there in the, in the dark mm. and the things that it does i was talk, talking to her about what that does to your brain and how touch is attenuated through emotional cycles and how it lowers ptsd outcomes and and it, we were both in tears it was a really interesting mm. kind of you know, discussion but yeah she's she's interesting too mm. so that's mm. is hicks is her name is it jill? yeah jill hicks jill jill, jill. Yeah, okay G. yeah all right mary well. free is mary free is a card you'll, you'll like <laughs> <laughs> all right well maybe i'll get you to introduce us by email or something yes, yeah indeed yes. mm. all right well thanks fiona i really appreciate this and enjoyed it a lot yeah, I did too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Talk again. Bye. Bye. Well, wasn't that fascinating? I hope you enjoyed that interview with Fiona as much as I did. The science behind what's happening in our brains in certain situations is astounding, and it does explain a lot of everyday situations. 
Now, all the ideas and tips and thoughts that Fiona shared with us can be found at innovabiz.com.au forward slash Fiona Kerr. That is F-I-O-N-A-K-E-R-R. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.com.au forward slash Fiona Kerr. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Fiona there, as well as links to her website and to a range of talks that she has given. Fiona suggested I interview Mary Freer of the Compassion Lab and also Jill Hicks of Mad for Peace on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So Mary and Jill, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Fiona Kerr. If you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast. I'm sure there's other ways you can subscribe too, but they're the ones that I know so that you'll never miss a future episode. Now, we'd also love you to leave us a review. We always welcome feedback and reviews to let us know how we're doing. If there's something you want us to cover, questions you want answered on a future Innova Buzz podcast, or indeed guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating. <music>